Hello, good evening, everybody, and welcome to uh, tonight's event from the Jesus College Intellectual Forum. My name is Julian Huppert. I'm the director of the Intellectual Forum here at Jesus College, which you can see behind me in slightly sunnier, slightly warmer times. Uh, it's great to have you all here. We are recording this event uh, for those who, who cannot make it. Now, Jesus College is an old, ancient institution. Originally set up as a 12th century nunnery, we became an all-male college in 1496, something we corrected 41 years ago. And we've been through many, many different issues. The Intellectual Forum is, is much more recent. We were set up about four years ago to really focus on the key issues of our time, to get people thinking and talking, and to reach out beyond the boundaries of our own college. And so we've had many stellar speakers come and, and take part in events for us. Everybody from the fashion designer, Jimmy Chu, the former New Zealand Prime Minister, Helen Clark, director of NASA's Deep Space X-ray Observatory, Belinda Wilkes, Al Jean, executive producer of The Simpsons, and many, many more. We've also showcased the amazing work that's being done by our own fellows, whether hearing from a physicist about the coldest things in the universe, actually even colder than outer space, or looking at ways to use synthetic biology to come up with non-polluting, clean, safe ways to dye clothes. One highlight I have to say was our, the president of our college, a very distinguished linguist, talking about swearing. Where do swear words come from and why are they effective? Climate has been a major focus for us over the years. Um, the climate crisis is one of the most important things that we face as a species, as a planet. And so we've had lots of events, some public events, such as talking about food and the effect it has on climate with the wonderful Professor Sarah Bridal. We ran a global conference called Cambridge Global Conversations, looking at climate ethics. What is it that we need to do, that we morally ought to do to tackle the climate crisis? We held a climate finance conference, working with hedge funds to look at what the realities of climate change and what can the financial system do to tackle it? And many more. And tonight we have another important, very exciting event on a similar subject. And I'm really delighted that we have with us Dr. Ellen Quigley. Ellen is many, many things. She is the advisor to the chief financial officer at the University of Cambridge, leading on responsible investment. She's probably the person most responsible for the university's new, very progressive policies. She's a senior research associate looking at climate risk and sustainable finance at the centre for the study of existential risk, because climate is such a huge problem. And she is also at Jesus College. She's one of our college postdoctoral associates, and we're delighted to have her with you for reasons which will become very obvious very shortly. So we're going to hear from Ellen, and then there'll be a chance for you to raise your own questions. So please do submit those using the Q&A function on Zoom. Ellen's very happy to have questions as we go along, so please do put in your thoughts and your comments as we go. So, Ellen, it's wonderful to have you here. Can I hand over to you now? Yes, you can. Thank you very much, Julian. Um, lovely to be with you all here today. Um, and uh, I, I am very happy to make this more of a conversational um, exchange, so please do um, pop things into the Q&A box and, uh, and I'll not talk at you for very long at all. I just want to lay out some, some context for the discussion that we'll have um, so that we've all got a common base for what we're discussing tonight. Um, so I'll begin just by outlining a bit my kind of evolution through um, everything from um, divestment to positive investment to universal ownership and how they've all kind of intertwined in uh, the, the sort of approach to responsible investment that um, I and others have been working on uh, for several years now. Um, so I started out as a, a divestment activist uh, almost a decade ago, I suppose, um, and ended up looking into the kind of mechanics of the financial system for that reason. And in the process sort of talked myself out of being a divestment activist, which is going to sound strange uh, in a moment when I tell you the, the subsequent evolution of, of thought. Um, but it's because uh, what I learned was that just selling shares in the stock market uh, for companies that are already listed on the stock market doesn't actually affect those companies because when you sell a share, by definition, there's a buyer and the company doesn't actually receive any of the money when you exchange shares between and among shareholders. 
And uh, in most divestment activity, and this is still true, is about the um, about public equity. And public equity is you know, shares in companies that are already listed on the stock market, what we call the secondary market. Uh, so that started to make me rather concerned about the kind of basis for divestment. Would it be kind of a useless uh, symbolic act? Uh, what was I um, arguing for, for my institution at the time to do? Um, and, and, and that kind of sparked the, the question, well, then how does one actually redirect financing um, where are new capital flows coming from and where are they going? And that ended up uh, taking me to uh, a place in which I ended up concentrating a lot on other asset classes. So just to, to back up for anyone who's not a specialist in this area, um, do put in the Q&A anything that I'm not being clear enough about. I'm happy to clarify. Um, in fact, I'm going to put this up here um, right here so that I can, can, can verify if there's anything that people need further clarification on. Um, anyway, so, so if you invest, you have multiple asset classes in which you invest. Um, so the one that people talk about the most is public equity, um, but there are also uh, bonds or fixed income. And that's often many of the same companies that are listed on the stock market. Uh, they will issue a bond um, for investors to purchase when they want to borrow money. So if you buy a bond, you are lending money to the company that you buy the bond from. It's a bit counterintuitive. Um, there are also other asset classes like private equity, for example, uh, that's investing in a company that's not listed on the stock market. So it's usually smaller, although there's some very large private companies as well. Um, and then you've got venture capital. Uh, so that's very early stage companies as well. It's quite high impact to invest in those companies because they are quite desperate for uh, capital to grow. Um, et cetera. And if you if you look at the life cycle of a company, this is what I've kind of come to understand. Um, you do start out with that venture capital stage, a fledgling company that really does desperately need every new dollar or pound that it can get. Um, and then uh, typically, and this is not always how it works, obviously, but typically it will become, you know, a, a, a private company if it's successful. Um, so then it would be invested in via the kind of private equity channels. Um, and then if it got big enough, it might eventually list on the stock market um, through what we call an initial public offering. And that's when it does get a large influx of new capital from investors as it's listing on the stock market. And it usually does this so that it can pay off early investors, grow by bringing in a whole bunch of new money all at once to, to um, fund an expansion plan, um, et cetera. There are also things called SPACs that have gotten really popular lately. There are other ways of listing on the stock market, but we'll keep this conversation simple for now. So if you look at this whole ecosystem for, uh, for an investor, you have to kind of decide which, which actions do you take across each of these asset classes to have uh, a big enough impact or maximum impact, really. Um, and, and you have to kind of approach them rather differently. Um, you also have to pay attention, by the way, to other financial sector players because they have a critical role to play as well. And I'll just name two, um, but there are others that also have a, a big role to play. Um, one is banks and the other is uh, insurance companies. Um, and I'll come back to this in a moment. Um, okay, so someone wants me to des describe uh, SPACs briefly. Uh, so that's basically like a reverse IPO sort of thing. So um, a SPAC is a, a special purpose acquisition. Anyway, I, I can't remember the acronym, but it basically means that they raise the money first and then they go find a company to list on the stock market. Um, so it's sort of the other way around. And it also involves a lot less disclosure because usually if you do an IPO, you have to show uh, that you're a good company to, to invest in, that you have um, already had kind of enough financial success to, um, to, to warrant listing. Whereas a SPAC, you can have um, much uh, more kind of lofty forward projections and still list on the stock market. Um, anyway, but that, yeah, um, you can also do a direct listing there, are, yeah at least three options, but um, yeah, a SPAC is, is a blank check. Yes, thank you, Sue Knowles. Um, that's, that's right. Um, so so you, you get all the, the, the investments together um, and then you, uh, you go and find the company that you actually want to, uh, to list after the fact. Um, anyway, so, so, so you, you've, you've got all these asset classes, you're trying to decide how do I have um, as great an impact as possible? Um, and you, then you have to ask the question, where is that new capital coming from? And the answer is uh, perhaps surprisingly that about 90% of new capital for fossil fuels, for example, comes from debt. And uh, 
a large chunk of that comes from banks. Um, and, and, and banks also underwrite uh, both bonds, um, so that's the, the instruments that you can purchase, um, but they also um, underwrite uh, initial public offerings, IPOs, as we've discussed. Um, they also underwrite uh, you know, new equity issues, so that's not as common these days, um, but um, a company that's already listed on the stock market can issue new shares and, and gain new capital that way, um, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so, so banks end up covering off quite a lot of the ways in which a company um, can get new money to do new things with. And sorry, I'm just gonna pause for a moment to look at this longer question here. The question is, but Ellen, doesn't disinvestment put pressure on the financial institutions, inform the public, lead to follow-ons, and ultimately put pressure on the carbon companies if there is enough of a move, which will make it harder to raise capital? Uh, so. Um, oddly, I will so happily answer that question um, in a moment because I, I, I quite agree with you um, and, and, and with some more details, but uh, we'll just come to that in a moment. Um, but thank you for, for your comment. Um, so, and, and sorry, I, uh, I've missed another comment here as well. So I'm interested to hear your thoughts on the Climate Club idea forwarded by uh, William Nordhaus. So I'm, I'm a bit cautious because William Nordhaus's models have been quite unhelpful in uh, reassuring people as to the uh, worst case scenarios of climate change. Um, but I'd be curious to hear more about it. I don't actually know about the Climate Club, but if you include another question uh, in the q and I'd be very curious to discuss it. Um, anyway, so, so you're looking at a, a, a really a debt story. Um, 90% of uh, new financing for fossil fuels comes from debt. So the, this focus on public equity is a bit um, unfortunate. And when I started realizing this, um, I, I also then started to question the whole um, ESG or responsible investment industry. So ESG stands for environmental, social, and governance investing. Uh, responsible investing is sometimes shortened to RI. There's also socially responsible investing, investing so SRI. Uh, but it's, and there are some differences, but, um, you know, it, it, it's uh, basically, much the same approach. And what I discovered is that um, all of that pretty much focuses on stock picking within public equity. And if you look at the evidence on this, it's, it's really quite um, depressing. Um, so there's a question here, debt is bonds. Um, yes, yeah, so debt is, uh, it includes bonds. It also includes loans, uh, credit facilities, um, stuff like that. So it's a, there are a variety of different types of debt, but yes, bonds are one form of debt. When you um, buy a bond, you are lending money to the company. Um, so to go, to go back to responsible investment for a moment, um, I, I started to realize that uh, responsible investment was a kind of stock picking exercise. You would end up with these fancy screens that would take out uh, you know, fossil fuels and arms companies, uh, for example, um, from an index and label it that as uh, an ethical investment. And I started to realize how very problematic that was because people thought, and, and I had thought uh, until I looked into it, that if you invest in something um, and if you, you know, invest in an index that does not include these you know, companies that are doing things that you find ethically objectionable, that it was somehow um, hurting or at least not helping those companies. Um, but it turns out that's as discussed a little bit earlier, that there's just no um, what's called additionality in that. So any additional dollar that you um, invest in a company that's already listed on the stock market doesn't really um, help that company, nor does the removal of that hurt that company. And there are some um, margin cases we can get into later because it gets um, kind of interesting and complicated. Um, but in general, um, especially if you don't announce it, um, stock picking within public equity just isn't that effective. Um, in the course of uh, writing the report for the university on uh, divestment specifically, the advantages and disadvantages of a policy of divestment according to five different dimensions, and they were uh, moral, social, political, financial, and reputational, um, I had a chance to really dig into the evidence on this and compile um, the, the, the various literatures that would basically ask, allow us to, to answer some of these questions. Um, I've got another question here, so I'm just going to turn to that for a moment. Um, some five years or so ago, I thought that a lot of fossil fuel capital actually came from cash flow of the companies, albeit uh, backed up by long-term debt. Any comment, as obviously this makes disinvestment much more difficult. Uh, very good point. Yes, there. These are cash rich companies. They do make a lot of money 
uh, from just selling fossil fuels, uh, but they also use a lot of debt. So both of those things are true. Um, and they do need debt to continue to um, especially engage in very high uh, upfront cost um, infrastructure, that sort of thing. So um, so it, it can still be effective to, uh, any, I'm, I'm previewing what I'm about to say about, uh, about the evidence around asset classes, but um, it does actually uh, appear to have slightly, at least already, have affected the cost of borrowing for companies. Um, the divestment movement um, thus far has already um, appeared to have done that to some extent. Um, there's another question here. Does the public announcement of divestment not hurt the companies which you divest from? And the answer to that is yes, um, as well. So I'll, I'll come to divestment and the kind of theory of change thing in a moment, because it's actually really critical and really interesting. Um, but to come back to uh, to the kind of asset class question, um, it does look like uh, the, the, the divestment movement, even though it also has not tended to focus on uh, debt, that it, ha it has tended to focus on shares as well, but even to the extent that it has um, made it into people's bond portfolios and so on and so forth, um, it does appear to have already affected cost of capital. Uh, so the cost of borrowing um, has gone up somewhat already for fossil fuels due to the divestment movement. And that's despite the fact that, um, again, for a lot of uh, institutions that it doesn't even really occur, that, occur to them to look into their bond portfolio. I'm not blaming these institutions for that. You know, they're obviously taking a stand in a really important way. Um, but if you imagine that all of the institutions that have already divested but not thought about their bond portfolio, if they were to do so, and we've already seen a, an effect thus far, um, you could imagine that it could actually get to the point at which um, there is a, a real effect on, um, on fossil fuel companies' ability to especially finance new, expensive, upfront, uh, high-cost uh, infrastructure. Um, so that's quite, uh, there's quite a lot of potential there, um, I thought. So, um, and sorry, there's another question here. Um, would this divestment movement lead to a market for stranded assets? Um, I would like a bit of elaboration on that question because I'm wondering if the, this person is asking whether there's kind of an advantage for people to buy up the stranded assets that have been stranded due to divestment or whether the question is, um, anyway, if you wouldn't mind uh, elaborating, that would be amazing and I'll come back to it and answer it. Um, anyway, so you, so you have this situation in which it, it sort of matters which things you do across which asset classes. Um, and then when I looked into the kind of social and political effects of divestment, um, I don't think I had fully recognized what the theory of change there was. And, um, and I've really come around to finding it a, 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 finding it a compelling theory of change. So the idea with divestment is that it's not necessarily aimed at trying to affect cost of capital or anything else, that it's aimed at, uh, at the, the core of what needs to be done to actually solve climate change. I think most people would agree that you need legislation, that without legislation, it's very difficult to get anywhere on this issue, um, and that that legislation has to include uh, you know, uh, pricing carbon, but also a lot of other uh, regulations and, and, and rules to, to, to encourage the growth of the new economy and to shut down the old, especially in a way that is um, that allows for a just transition for the workers involved. Um, but how do you get that legislation when you have um, quite a powerful lobby um, that is able to counter that and where the public doesn't have um, a negative enough view of uh, fossil fuels to actually make that happen? Um, I'm just going to keep with this for a moment. There are some great questions coming through, so I'll come back to those for a moment. Um, but basically, we don't tend to legislate uh, companies, sectors, uh, activities in general that society doesn't view as problematic morally or practically. Um, so so it's, it's, that's a huge barrier to getting the kind of uh, legislation that we need if you think that um, the fossil fuel industry also has quite a lot of capital and power, especially lobbying power itself. So what the, the, what the divestment movement does is it, it says, well, what, what we need to do is stigmatize this sector sufficiently so that public opinion changes, A, and B, politicians get the cover they need to enact the legislation that's actually required to solve this problem. Um, and by doing that, you end up kind of countering the uh, kind of lobbying power of a very powerful in industry. Um, 
you're, you're essentially laying the groundwork for the legislative change. And what's interesting about that too, is that it ends up affecting more than just the listed companies, the, the companies that are listed on the stock market. Um, if you properly legislate um, around climate change, you should end up affecting uh, the national oil companies as well, which dig up a large proportion of um, the fossil fuels that we that we burn as well. So, um, so the theory of change really isn't about the financing. It's about changing the public, uh, ch changing the public's view of fossil fuels, stigmatizing it. And also, there there are another few factors in play that have to do with you know who wants to go work for a company that has been stigmatized so heavily especially with the divestment movement really taking hold um, on university campuses, you can imagine that that has played a role in uh, you know, recruitment challenges for the executives of fossil fuel companies. And if you talk to, if you look at surveys of uh, fossil fuel, or sorry, of, of executives in any sector, recruitment of top talent is always either the top concern or at least in the top three. Um, so that's always an enormous challenge and one that is kind of directly affected by the divestment movement. Um, and there have actually been some interesting examples um, close to home, um, cases in which you know the, the um, types of large events that used to be possible for recruitment um, at universities um, have not been as possible uh, even before the pandemic made that um, an extra challenge. So we have, this this whole political uh, source of potential influence that comes from the divestment movement, and then you have the actual impact on the cost of capital through divesting in asset classes other than public equity. So, I mean, all of this, having now reviewed all of the evidence, I am rather persuaded that divestment was the right call for the University of Cambridge, especially as an institution that has a lot of legitimacy, a uh, really good brand name, and the ability to get a big headline. And we did, we got amazing headlines from all over the world. Um, that's that's a, a good argument for taking that as your um, approach when you have the ability to contribute to the shift in social discourse that's required. Um, so all quite interested and complicated uh, because it's not just about um, you know where each dollar goes, it's also uh, the, the political environment in which these companies end up getting regulated. And that in turn actually affects the financial system too because people fear um, stranded assets uh, as a kind of inevitable response or, or result if we end up with legislation that basically forces that stranding. Um, and by the way, maybe I should define stranded assets. It's basically um, assets, let's say like a coal plant uh, that used to be worth a lot of money, but no longer is because of um, either uh, carbon pricing or legislative um, action um, or even just finances. Cause now actually coal is more expensive, building new coal is more expensive than uh, building new renewables in all major markets. But in some markets, it's actually cheaper to build new renewables than to run old coal plants um, so that you can end up being having an asset stranded um, by a, a number of different routes, um, including economic now, which is quite exciting. Um, so I'm just gonna take a pause and go through some of these great questions um, and then continue on, on with some remarks about universal ownership theory. Um, so I'll just flag that now. Um, so there's a question here. Are you saying that divestment policy of large institutions, e.g. the Church of England, the Catholic Church, are a waste of time? Uh, I hope that I've made clear that I do not believe that at all. Uh, that in fact, I think it's a very important social movement that has um, already affected uh, social discourse. So there's um, some really, there's some interesting papers on this, um, uh, showing the ways in which uh, the divestment movement has already shifted social discourse. Um, and also many of those institutions have uh, started to look at their bond portfolio where there's this direct effect from divestment as well. So no, definitely not a waste of time. Um, definitely a very important um, movement. Um, another question here, what would you say is the role of cryptocurrencies in, in the future financial system? Are currencies like Bitcoin really feasible, bearing in mind the massive amount of electricity required to pr process a single transaction? Um, so I'm, I'm pretty anti-Bitcoin for that precise reason, um, as uh, the evidence from uh, a Cambridge uh, group of academics came out, I think just a few weeks ago, uh, that uh, Bitcoin uses more electricity than Argentina. That's really quite problematic. Also, as I understand it, the, the processing power required actually increases as you, um, as they become, um, yeah, you have to use more processing power now to, to create each new Bitcoin. Um, so I 
I personally um, am not a fan. I think that there are efforts to um, build new cryptocurrencies that do not have uh, such great energy needs. And I think that actually blockchain itself could be kind of interesting for uh, tracking um, certain things that you want to have assurance, you know, for example, that your uh, cobalt from the Congo was not uh, mined using child labor or something like that. Blockchain could actually be useful for verification of certain things. Um, so I think there might be uses, but I'm not a big fan of Bitcoin personally. Um, I have another question here. How do you think the recent pandemic has forced a shift towards circular economics and finance? Were the supply chain shocks enough to force companies to make real changes now? Um, I don't know. I think it's too early to say whether we'll see permanent or semi-permanent changes to supply chain man management. Um, I'm a little skeptical about circular um, economy measures as well, because often it's not that circular. There's a lot of energy um, that needs to be uh, used to transform the product back into its original state. Um, and we can't have kind of infinite energy usage, even if we kind of maintain the use of a particular material. Um, if it takes that much extra energy, we don't have the space or materials to, to, to use that much. Um, okay, we have another question here. There are a number of players in the market that focus on distressed assets, special situations, et cetera. So hypothetically looking at a situation where the mainstream focuses on responsible investing and end up creating a market for those assets such as fossil fuels, which are stranded. Okay, that's such an inter interesting point. And this gets us into some of the complexities. So, um, Economic theory would tell you that we should not be seeing much of a much, if any, of an effect on cost of capital from uh, on the debt side, even um, because there should be, you know, an, an equilibrium there. Um, but what's actually what's true about the debt market is that people behave a little bit differently in that market. Um, overall, it tends to be a more risk averse part of the market um, because. Uh, bonds, for example, uh, are generally safer. Uh, I mean, they, bondholders get their money back more often than shareholders do if a company goes bust, um, et cetera. So it, it, it is a safer asset. Therefore, the mindset of people who invest in that asset class tends to be different. And you end up with herd behavior that you don't tend to see as much um, in other spaces. So even though it might make sense just purely looking at the balance sheet of a company to lend to them, if you start to see others running for the exit, um, you might start to think that way as well if you're, um, if you're a, a, a lender or a, a bond holder. So it's kind of interesting, you start to see these sort of nonlinear dynamics in terms of uh, increases in cost of capital and so on. But what that does is if it does affect cost of capital, then you end up with higher returns for those who remain. And it's hard to figure out, you know, where those things will balance each other out. Also, I mean, I think you can imagine a scenario in which you end up with distressed lenders being the only ones left who are willing to uh, lend to coal companies, for example. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised to see that happen ra rather soon, given how much movement is happening on the bank side uh, lately. So if that's the case, um, then you would end up disproportionately rewarding um, any investors who continued to uh, lend to fossil fuel companies. Um, but you could imagine that uh, governments might actually begin to step in at a certain point because they would have no um, kind of legitimate institutions defending that practice anymore, which would kind of shift the lobbying power such that, uh, you know, the, and if the public is very much in favor of doing something about climate change, which is also increasingly the case, you could imagine legislators deciding to kind of crack down on the distressed lending space, for example, if that was, you know, the sole source of new financing for, for fossil fuels that would otherwise um, kind of go bust uh, naturally. Um, so I think that's, <laughs> this is not a, a proper answer in that I don't know exactly what's going to happen there, but I think it's a really interesting scenario to think through. Um, I think we could end up in a scenario in which people who continue to lend uh, or, or buy the bonds of uh, fossil fuel companies could make more money, um, at least for a time. But I also think that there's probably a limit to that because uh, I, I suppose you, I suspect you would probably see uh, legislation come uh, into the picture. Um, Okay, these are great questions, by the way. Um, may you quickly go back over what the divestment movement is? Thanks. Yes, happily. So the divestment movement is to um, remove investments in fossil fuels. So it's usually an institutional movement. So the idea is to get 
institutions like universities or pension funds to sell their investments in fossil fuels. Um, and the definition of fossil fuels can be rather broad, um, but it can be as narrow as just upstream um, oil and gas companies and coal, or it can be quite quite broad and include uh, pipelines and downstream refineries, and et cetera, et cetera, oil and gas service companies, um, the whole list. Um, and that can be across asset classes, or it can be much more narrow um, and, and only include uh, public equity, which I wouldn't recommend. I, I think if you're going to divest, do it across all asset classes. If you come away from this talk with one conclusion, I, I hope it's that. Um, okay, uh, Kesha. Uh, indeed, we are already seeing students not wanting to work with fossil fuel companies, even as an intern or getting funding from them. Yes, exactly. And I think that actually is a power that might be um, not quite appreciated by some of the, the people who are working in this space. Um, again, if you look at what uh, executives really worry about, it's talent, um, both attracting talent in the first place and retaining talent. And fossil fuel companies are increasingly finding that very difficult. Um, and, and they do take that probably more seriously, honestly, than the divestment movement itself at this stage. Um, Another question here, how do you stigmatize such huge vested interests, oil rich nations, et cetera? Um, really good question. So I don't think it's as easy to stigmatize oil rich nations, but it already has worked to stigmatize the fossil fuel sector. Um, and by using, it, it's, it's really interesting to look at the, the language that's used to do that, by the way. Um, so by labeling it as dirty, um, as, you know, like just the oily, the, uh, you know, the, the kind of, visceral language that's used to discuss to, to describe the fossil fuel um, companies the the dirty the pollution the um, particulate matter all of this stuff um, you know helps to, to really just associate in people's minds fossil fuels with uh, undesirable things um, and and that's yeah again I think it's it's probably more difficult to stigmatize a country not least because you don't want to end up stigmatizing the people in that country who may or may not be supportive of um, the, the the country's focus on fossil fuels, but if you stigmatize the sector and, and, and its activities, um, then that should actually flow uh, onto the, the countries that, that have a, 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 or at least the, the oil and gas industry and coal industry in those countries as well. Um, it's hard to kind of escape that. If, if, you, if you're stigmatizing a whole sector, um, it would be very hard to kind of distinguish yourself meaningfully if you were still a fossil fuel company. Um, so if, it does end, end up um, being fairly effective to just um, stigmatize the whole lot. And by the way, there aren't any fossil fuel companies yet that are, you know, truly on in a transition. There are a couple that have done some interesting things in the last year, but there is still none that is, um, you know, fully aligned with the Paris Agreement. So it's still kind of legitimate to um, stigmatize the, the whole lot, even though there are some differences in, in how they're approaching the issue. Some are in complete denial, and that's very different. Um, Another question here, what about the large amount of investments by these fossil fuel companies in renewable energies? Okay, so that is actually a myth. So I looked into that for the divestment report and the amount that companies are, pour, are putting into renewables um, is still very, very, very small. Um, so a couple of the very large fossil fuel companies have just announced um, dramatic increases, but in most cases that will still take it to, you know, potentially maximum 15% of their capital expenditure budget. So that means that still a large majority of the of the money that they're spending will still go towards um, continued exploration and extraction of fossil fuels. Um, and the other thing to pay attention to is what is classified as renewable energy. Um, this is a bugbear of mine, so bear with me, but um, you know, <laughs> Some, you know, we'll probably need some carbon capture and storage, for example, uh, to, to actually get to, to net zero. Uh, but, you know, 85% of carbon capture and storage currently is used for enhanced oil recovery. And of course, you could say, well, you know, we, it, it's better to um, get more oil out of the uh, wells that have already been dug uh, than, you know, drilling for new ones. And that is true. But I think we, we do need to get to the point at which um, CCS is not solely about um, maximizing the um, extraction of, of fossil fuels in the first place. Um, you also end up seeing a lot of the renewable spending or what's classified as renewable spending by fossil fuel companies um, being biofuels, which have huge land use issues associated with them, um, unless they're algal or something like that. But I don't tend to see much of that. Um, so anyway, you need to really 
look at what is considered renewable. Um, in fact, hydrogen is often in there too, and that's complicated. Hydrogen can, you know, be really not green. So um, anyway, it's it's worth kind of looking at those numbers with some skepticism because I'm I'm not convinced that, you know, a, a large amount of uh, spending on renewables is coming from fossil fuels. In fact, the vast majority is not, and the vast majority of their spending is not on renewables. Um, all right, the next question here. Um, in terms of an average saver slash mortgage holder slash current account holder slash pension owner, what can we do to minimize our climate impact? Great question, switch banks. Um, I think that's probably the best thing that each that an individual person could do, but make sure you tell them why. Um, so there's a, a great report actually that just came out today. Uh, it's an annual report that looks at the total amount of fossil fuel uh, lending and underwriting done by um, large banks. You can go look at that list and see if your bank is on it. And if it is, switch banks and tell them why uh, and switch to a, 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 a greener bank. And, and often, you know, local or community banks or cooperative banks, credit unions um, will, uh, I mean, most of them are not big enough to lend to fossil fuels in the first place, you're probably safe, um, but you can research that. There are actually a lot of bank switch uh, websites and so on and so forth, so just Google it and, and, and make it happen. The other thing is that pensions don't hear from pension holders very often about this stuff at all. Um, so if I talk to uh, even you know the person who's heading up responsible investment at a pension fund, they will get five emails a, a year and that will be a banner year. So if they actually get 10 emails this year, they'll think, wow, there's been this huge uh, surge in attention um, as, as to climate change. And they'll, you know, that might make it to the board. Like it, it's, um, they, they hear from so few people that it could actually make a big difference to hear from a few more. Um, I know that sounds crazy, but it, it is true. Your pension funds, uh, and we'll get into this in a moment because of um, the my focus on universal ownership, but um, pension funds and sovereign wealth funds and other very large institutional investors actually own a majority of assets globally. Um, they're the really big players, they're the really important players, and they're the ones who have as their clients the very largest asset managers. So, um, you know, you need to, you know, I, I think if you, if you had a focus on trying to shift your pension fund um, and not towards ESG necessarily, if it's just public equity, remember they've got to pay attention to debt. Um, then, you know, those are really the, the two big focal points, I would say. Um, another good question here, uh, don't you need to transition to positive impact investment? Will divestment stimulate this? Uh, really good question. So the, the short answer is yes, but the longer answer is that's not enough. And I think this is where I sort of went wrong in my own thinking for a while, because I thought, well, if you just invest in renewables, um, then, you know, that, that sort of gradually undercuts fossil fuels and you end up replacing them. But actually, I mean, this is not my phrase, but people have been talking about how we haven't had so much a transition as an addition. So we, we've we been continuing to increase our fossil fuel uh, use um, and therefore emissions uh, while also building up um, a lot more renewables. So renewables haven't necessarily been replacing fossil fuels um, and it's certainly not um, hampering their growth enough. So, um, you know, that's that's a pretty important question to um, to address because um, we, we do need to have a laser focus, not just on doing the good things, um, but also on ensuring that we, we, we don't finance new fossil fuel infrastructure. And actually, maybe I just take a moment and iron over that for a moment, because I think one of the things that I've really concluded from all of this is that um, we do need to be looking at um, how to, to make our job, our future job easier. So if you look at what we're going to have to do, we're going to have to transition a whole lot of workers and a whole lot of infrastructure away from fossil fuels and towards, uh, you know, a, a zero carbon econ economy. And if we continue to build new fossil fuel infrastructure now, it will make it a lot harder to do that. We'll bring more workers into a field that needs to be shut down, that they need to be kind of eased out of in a, um, a, a just manner. Um, but it also means it's much harder to shut down something um, that's already been built. The upfront cost has been spent. Um, and, and, and at that point, it's, it's less likely that they'd be able to, um, you know, th that renewables would be able to compete favorably. Um, so you, you end up in a situation in which um, it's just, a, a bit of a losing battle once the thing is built. If you can prevent it from being built in the first place, that's critical. And, and that refers to the concept of carbon lock-in. Because once you build something, 
that is meant to run off of fossil fuels. Um, it's it, it kind of locks in that consumption of fossil fuels and thereby and, th and therefore the associated emissions as well. So, um, so that's actually really critical. Positive investment is not enough. You also need to make sure that you tr that you um, run down fossil fuel resources um, as, as rapidly and justly as possible. Um, I'm just going to pause um, from the. These are such amazing questions, but there are dozens of them. So I'm just going to jump into universal ownership for a moment, and then come back to some more questions. Um, Universal ownership, I think, is an interesting concept because it brings a lot of what we've been discussing together into one kind of cohesive narrative and, and framework, really. Um, so universal owners uh, usually are referred to as pension funds or sovereign wealth funds, um, some university endowments, etc. cetera, uh, basically large long-term entities like that uh, that are diversified, which means that they basically own a more or less representative slice of the entire economy. And if you own everything, then you actually have an interest in the health of that whole system. You start to care, or you should care, a little less about the performance of any given individual company, and you would want to look much more systemically at the uh, risks and costs associated with what economists call externalities. Externalities being the negative effects of things that uh, that uh, companies do that aren't costed into the system. So uh, the best thing, is, yeah, the, the easiest example would be um, Exxon and their, uh, the costs associated with the emissions produced by um, the fossil fuels that it um, extracts, um, combusts, etc. So, if you, um, so if, if you look at the, the kind of externalities costs, especially in the long term, you know, 30 years of uh, emissions from Exxon will add costs to the companies all across your portfolio. So, so for an investor who owns Exxon, but also owns everything else, it might make sense to actually lose some money on Exxon as it runs down, rather than having Exxon continue to, to add costs to the whole system. Um, by the way, this applies to a number of other issues as well. So let's look at something like uh, income inequality or wealth inequality. So if you ask, you know, even a mainstream institution like the OECD, um, it would match probably what our moral intu intuition which would be, which is that it's not good to have uh, drastic inequality in society. Um, it's actually a macroeconomic drag. So even if you were just purely looking at it from a financial standpoint, you would conclude that if you had a system-wide view um, of the health of a long-term portfolio, you should want to reduce income and wealth inequality because that will benefit your overall returns over time. Um, so it's kind of a, an interesting confluence of, the, of the, 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 the moral imperative that a lot of people feel to address climate change um, and reduce inequality, um, but it, it, it does work out um, financially for universal owners because uh, because they end up paying for things in that kind of systemic manner. Another interesting um, example would be antimicrobial resistance, for example, because um, you end up with uh, large companies that, uh, you know, run feedlots or whatever, and they're using um, antibiotics prophylactically uh, and keeping animals really close, um, crowded close together, um, you know, and then they, they get sick much more often, etc. So, um, and, and that that use of antibiotics in that manner um, tends to make it more likely that the diseases that we're trying to prevent um, will evolve to, to um, be able to resist uh, the antibiotics that we have. And that's actually really scary because we're running out of antibiotics as kind of um, uh, last option um, uh, kind of safeguards for illnesses that that are resistant to the, to the usual ones that we use. Um, and, you know, some of the same issues with um, you know, antifungals and so on and so forth. Uh, so it's very scary, um, but you could actually end up reducing that risk as an investor. Um, let's say you're a large pension fund and you decide to glom together with other large pension funds and you tell uh, McDonald's, let's say, we will vote against the reelection of your directors if you, you know, if you don't develop a plan to um, phase out the prophylactic use of antibiotics and do a couple of other things that would reduce um, the risk of, um, of this terrible problem, which by the way, would have enormous costs for the whole system in the next 30 years. Like it's in the trillions upon trillions. Um, so not a minor issue. Well, if you're McDonald's, you, you probably think, well, that's cost to the system. 
But if you were a universal owner, you think, well, uh, you know, Europe in general doesn't um, engage in these practices because they've got um, laws to do this. Well, you know, you can actually make sure that that, that standard is across the board and there's no advantage to any company um, to, to, you know, not meeting these standards. Um, it's the same for everyone. There's no kind of forum shopping um, advantage. Um, and actually, if you think about it from the perspective of uh, of the executives um, or boards of those companies, I mean, just imagine if your job did not involve having to make money off of, for example, um, you know, uh, crowding animals too close together or emitting a lot of um, uh, uh, pollutants um, or paying workers really poorly. Um, you would kind of compete on other things then. Um, so I'll just maybe back up for a moment and talk about the mechanisms by which you can make that happen as a universal owner. So I hope one of the things that you would conclude based on what we've already discussed is that if you're a universal owner, you should really pay attention to what is in your bond portfolio and your private equity portfolio and any venture capital investments that you have and that you should make sure that you're only supporting the companies to grow um, that uh, you know, are, are not contributing to these enormous systemic risks like climate change and inequality. Um, but you also then have to figure out what to do with public equity. And although I think divestment makes sense for a well-known institution like Cambridge um, and for a sector like fossil fuels that have become the focus of a major political movement like the divestment, the fossil fuel divestment movement, you can't actually divest um, from every company that's causing systemic risks. Um, at that point, you actually might even run up against some legal limits um, uh, based on diversification um, standards, et cetera, et cetera. It depends on the jurisdiction. Um, so if that's the case, then um, you need to think through, um, sorry, I'm getting distracted by uh, some of these questions. Um, so so if, if, if you, oh, I'm getting totally stuck. Um, Right, so if you want to figure out what to do and you can't just divest from everything across your whole uh, portfolio, um, and you can't, um, you know, I think if you were to trace back a lot of systemic risks, you would find um, a company contributing to it somewhere. Um, then you have to figure out what is the most effective to be, way to be an owner of these companies. And then you have to look at the vast literature um, on this topic uh, that, that exists and conclude that um, if you're going to be an effective shareholder, you're not going to use many of the same standards that or metrics um, and, and methods um, that are used typically today. Um, in fact, if you look at that literature, it's kind of depressing. Um, you end up concluding that shareholder engagement is not very effective because it hasn't been to date. It tends to make use of things like um, purely advisory shareholder resolutions that almost always lose. If they do pass, the implementation rate is poor and the implementation rate is even worse for, for resolutions that have to do with anything beyond disclosure. Um, and by the way, I went and looked at the literature on um, disclosure and it looks like there's no clear relationship between improved disclosure at the company level and uh, environmental uh, improvements in environmental performance. So it's not like improved disclosure actually leads to the kinds of outcomes that we would want. It just makes things more transparent, which is good, but that's not you know, actually reducing these real world risks. It's just making it more obvious where they're coming from um, and the precise uh, you know, metrics behind it. So, so if that's the case, then you need to look at what are the more effective tactics available to shareholders. And one of the interesting things that came out of that uh, literature review was that voting against the re-election of directors is actually fairly effective. And you don't have to win is the interesting thing um, because it's usually a routine vote. So a, a shareholder or a, a board member will often get like 90, 99% support from shareholders because it's sort of an, an automatic thing. You, you just vote and get that item off of the agenda. Um, if they even get in the low 90s, uh, it support. That is actually scary to a board member. It's a it's a group of high status individuals typically um, who don't want to be publicly embarrassed. Kind of makes sense. So um, to to lose support to to that level even um, is kind of a slap in the face, and that tends to wake up uh, board members to whatever issue is being raised with them, um, and it's associated with um, better outcomes. 
And again, that's, you know, you could end up with a shareholder resolution that passes with the majority of support. Um, and that gets less of a result than just getting a few percentage points of worth of um, uh, shareholders voting against the re-election of the board. So, you know, that this is where it really matters which method you're using to, to get this outcome. Um, and by the way, what's interesting is, is that we're starting to see more of a focus on voting against directors um, as a tactic. Um, so I, I would say that's kind of one of the, the new things that we're starting to see, and so is actually a focus on debt. So we're starting to see uh, both of these things come to the fore, and it gives me some hope in this um, ridiculous situation we find ourselves in. So um, the other thing that you could do, uh, by the way, um, in terms of uh, sh being an effective shareholder, um, has to do more with um, in inclusion in indices. So I'll just explain what an index is for a moment. It's basically when um, you you literally own a, a representative slice uh, of everything. So let's say it's a stock exchange um, that, uh, you know, like let's say it's the S&P 500 is a, a very common index. So that's 500 very large companies um, that are, uh, you know, uh, listed on a particular uh, stock exchange, so you basically own a little tiny slice of all 500 of those companies. If you own um, an, an ETF, let's say that's that's an exchange traded fund um, or or some other product uh, that that is um, a what, what's called a, a passive investment. So you basically just track the whole market. You're just owning a little bit of everything, and as the whole market goes up, um, your investment goes with it um, or down, as the case may be. Um, and it, as it turns out, um, exclusions uh, from the these indices, especially um, ones that have some kind of public announcement or something like that, that's actually a very powerful motivator for companies. So there have been a couple of studies looking at the FTSE for good index. So that's kind of like a responsible investment index. By the way, the standards are not high enough to get into it, but that's a separate issue. Um, if you if you get a, a a, a notice that you're about to be dropped from that index as a company, you are much more likely to um, comply with the standards of the index to maintain your position in it or to be readmitted if you do end up getting dropped. Um, so you tend to see, to see a lot more actual behavior change on the part of the company um, from even just the threat of being excluded from one of these indices. Um, even though it may not directly affect uh, you know, your, your, your company, it's kind of that, that reputational element. So. So just to, to back up for a moment, if you're a universal owner, um, you want to pay attention to what you're owning across all of these other asset classes. You may want to divest from fossil fuels and make a big announcement as well. Um, and then for the com remaining companies that you own, you'll want to glom together with other uh, universal owners and be very clear with uh, directors what they have to do to ensure that you don't vote against them and probably setting up some indexed uh, uh, products to um, allow for another way of engaging with companies by um, you know, either including or excluding them um, in an in index. Uh, those seem to be, from the evidence, um, the, the, the most effective ways of actually getting behavior change from companies. And there's a lot that remains to be done there, to be honest. Um, we still don't know the answers to a lot of questions. Like if you exclude a company from a bond index, is that even more effective because you're combining the effect of uh, an exclusion from an index as well as the threat of actually increasing the cost of capital because there is actual additionality um, in the bond market. So, uh, so that's the kind of overall uh, approach that a universal owner may take on the basis of the evidence that we have um, today. And it kind of you know, if, if we incorporate what we've learned about um, divestment and the kind of social discourse effects and the kind of um, shaming element to do with voting against the re-election of directors or exclusions from an index, um, you end up with a much more complex picture than just, you know, this dollar goes there and it does this. Um, it's much more complex. And I think, um, you know, just to um, perhaps um, conclude central remarks, but I'm happy to keep answering questions, of course, um, it's that we need to keep in mind, you know, what what the kind of holy grail is here. And, you know, from the perspective of climate change, um, it, it really is to make our jobs easier in the future. So again, just to reiterate, it's, a, it's all about um, tracking where capital is coming from that's going into um, the construction of new infrastructure, um, exploration for, for new reserves um, that, I mean, we have to keep most reserves that we already know about in the ground. So exploring for new reserves doesn't really make sense. 
um, etc. So um, really keeping that focus on um, on fossil fuels, on the sources of emissions um, is really critical as much as it is important that we build lots of new renewable infrastructure. Um, it's at least as important, if not more important to ensure that we are actually not just not building new uh, fossil fuel infrastructure, but winding down um, what we have and supporting legislative efforts as well, because that is ultimately what we need um, as well. Um, so I'll maybe um, turn back to the questions if that's um if that's good for you all um julian do you have anything you wanted to well, no, I, mean, I, I just wanted to give you a, a break because i'm exhausted just listening to you talk about all of this uh, and the amazing tour de force that it's been um, and we do have loads of questions so can i just butt in and ask a couple to try to capture yeah your please. Please, because your, your top tips were fantastic um now it's possible we have some universal owners um in the audience uh, and so you've been very clear what, what they ought to do. Um, for anybody who's listening who isn't themselves a universal owner, can I just come back to what they ought to do? So you've talked about changing your bank and really, and telling them why you want to change your bank. What else should people do? What, what, what should you know, each of us be doing in our daily lives to help with this project? Okay, um, I mean, talk, I mean, this this sounds, boring but talking about it a lot to everyone you know it is surprisingly interesting right i mean it's less boring than you would imagine um and and there are a lot of different uh, elements it's not just about finance as we say it's about you know social change and and all these other elements so it can actually be kind of fun to talk about anyway that's actually quite critical um because that's the way that we um you know spread ideas as a social mammal um but also i think having that focus on institutional investors that you happen to be affiliated with. And that's why earlier I had mentioned, you know, writing an email to your pension fund, again, that sounds boring, but actually uh, if you do that, they're unlikely to hear from that many people that year. Um, so that can be quite effective. And also, I mean, I do assume most of the people on this call are in the UK. So actually, you know, just the people on this call writing to their pension funds would probably, you know, significantly increase the number of responses that they got this year. Um, and and that, that is actually taken fairly seriously because they very rarely hear from beneficiaries on any topic, let alone climate change on any topic. Um, so I think that's, that's absolutely critical. And any other institutions that you are affiliated with that might be a foundation, uh, a university, a college, um, any other institution like that, that's a larger block of money than most of us have available to us, unless we're extremely lucky. Um, and then the other thing that you can do, and there are lots of options in the UK actually, to just directly yourself invest in, you know, community owned wind project projects, for example. I mean, there, there are just a lot of options to just um, directly invest in uh, renewables here. Um, so it's quite an impressive array um, and, 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 and something that, I mean, again, you know, that, that's not the whole picture. We can't just invest in, in good things and get out of this, this um, bind that we're in, but uh, certainly you can at least feel like you're contributing to locally owned um, energy production that's not adding to the problem. And can I just pick up on, on, on that, that side about investing in renewables? We've had, oh, we've had loads of, of questions. I think we're up to about 70 or so questions that have come in, so we're not gonna get through all of them. Um, but there's a couple wow. of questions which I, I thought fitted on, on with this side. So one from Stephen Mitchum, are there sufficient investment opportunities available to soak up the funds uh, that are freed up from divestment or, or are added to? You know, is there a risk that we end up overinflating the green qualifying market to levels that don't reflect the true financial value? I actually think that's a really interesting question and probably a partial answer is uh, yes, especially for you know, companies that are already listed on the stock market. I mean, green companies tend to be on the smaller end. So you actually could end up inflating their stock prices. Um, but that, again, that doesn't actually do anything to um, increase their, necessarily uh, increase their ability to build out more infrastructure because there may be other barriers in place. Um, and if you think about it, like it's not just a question of financing, right? You need to have a supply chain that can, um, you know, allow you to get all of the components for each of these things. Um, and you also need to have the skills available um, to construct them and so on and so forth. And I'm starting to hear that from, 
you know, there are still countries that are building coal plants, not necessarily because that makes sense even financially, but because they know where the supply chain is for that, they have the workers who know how to do that. So that's the other barrier. Um, so I think that is actually, yeah, a significant issue. Um, I still think there is probably still more space for, for green financing, um, but it's definitely something that needs, needs to be attended to. And that's kind of one of the other reasons that I tend to look more at the, the kind of dirty side um, as opposed to the green, because I think that it's not through necessarily the financing that we need to get the change um, required on the green financing side. So you, you mentioned um, coal um, and you mentioned the difference between the green side and the dirty side, which brings me to a question for, from uh, Nick King, who points out that new wind farms and renewables, improved public transport, vital for, uh, future infrastructure rely on steel. We don't have a way of making steel without coal. Um, so will we end up just ditching the coal and therefore not being able to do what we need to do, or that we just have to rely on production of, of, of coal in less scrupulous countries where they may make environmental damage somewhere else? You know, how, how do we think about the fact that the, cre the green side has some dirtiness to it? It's another great question. I love these questions. I'm definitely going to look through them all uh, later uh, for that precise reason. Um, so let me just say I'm not an expert on steel. Um, so what I'm saying is, is kind of high level. Um, but two things. One is people usually do distinguish between thermal coal and the coal that is used for steel because we know that it can't be fully decarbonized yet. That said, like you can actually bring down the emissions of steel to a certain extent by uh, at least allowing the um, electrical um, load to come from, um, you know, renewables. Um, it's done in Norway and so on uh, with hydro, um, etc. But also there are new technologies that are currently under development that some people think are not that many years away that will allow for um, a different way of, of making steel. In fact, I've heard that hydrogen um, may be a good pairing for steel for complex chemical reasons I actually don't understand because I'm not a chemist. Um, uh, so I I mean, I have some hope there. I, I also say this, there's a possibility that the solution in the end could be to, to you know, use coal still, but have, you know, that might, might be one of the uses that we um, have for carbon capture and storage. I happen to think that people plan to use carbon capture and storage way too much. It's almost like our modern form of indulgences and um, that we think everything can just be um, mopped up by carbon capture and storage. And I, I think we need to avoid that for most things. Steel though, may be one of the uh, ex exceptions in the end. And by the way, I just want to insult biomass for a moment because there is almost a bit of an opening for that and I forgot to do that before. Um, biomass is not a climate solution, um, especially now that there really isn't enough, you know, waste wood around to, to feed these things. They are actually um, contributing to deforestation, like the Drax power station um, up north in this country is the biggest in the world and it's running off of, you know, virgin forest in North America and um, emissions, you know, as high as coal or higher um, by some calculations. So let's not build biomass plants either. Now, there's been a few questions about ESG and you've been, been quite critical of ESG. So uh, Zanana Vitana says, you know, would you not recommend working in ESG in finance to, to make a difference to climate change? Um, you know, there's been, the, you know, how do we improve ESG? Um, there's a lot of people who are quite hopeful about it. You're quite critical. Uh, I also love that question. So I would, anybody who really learned about what, where the actual potential for impact is, should definitely go into ESG because we need you. Because people do not seem to recognize this. And, and I'm not actually blaming, I actually think people who go into ESG by and large are a very well-intentioned group of people. Um, but it's it's counterintuitive. What I've just said to you all today is very counterintuitive. And a lot of people have not thought about this or have not looked at the evidence behind a lot of the common practices in this field, um, which means that you have a lot of well-intentioned people unwittingly doing something that has had very little, if any, impact. Um, so I, I would hope that you would go into ESG if you're interested in this, and especially if you're willing to help shift the focus towards debt and private equity, um, and towards voting against the re-election of directors, because again, those are you know the things that we now 
know on the basis of the evidence we have today are more effective than the stock picking in public equity form of ESG. So yes, please go into the field if you you know are going to come and help change the field so that it becomes more like a, a, a universal ownership type approach. Um, we've had a few questions frequently say like, how do I find out where my pension is, who's good, um, what, who I ought to be reaching out to, you know? What are the best real sources of information, this is from Sue Niles, um, to find out how green banks or pension funds actually are, who you're invested with? What should we be doing? That's another really good question and one I don't have a great answer for, but I'll give you a couple of initial thoughts. So there is, I mean, this is not perfect, but it's pretty good. Um, the Rainforest Action Network um, report that came out today, so it comes out annually, and the 2021 report did land today. It's quite a good day, um, except for that it's not great news. Although fossil fuel financing actually did fall in 2020, and I actually did not think that was going to be the case because so many of them were on their, uh, were in, in dire straits and probably in uh, great need of capital. Um, but that report would would usually allow you to to figure out where your bank is um, in in terms of its fossil fuel lending. I, I will give you a caveat though, um, it tracks relatively closely to the size of the bank, so it doesn't give you a great sense of you know does my bank proportionally lend more to fossil fuels than you would expect for its size. It doesn't answer that question, but it will tell you the absolute figures, um, and that can be sobering um, for many of us. But you know then. You can switch to a bank that's not on the list, basically. And and I, again, I think if you go with a um, a local bank, a building society, a credit union, um, they're just not going to be big enough to. Uh, and great. Um, so Julian has put the report in the chat there. Yes. Um, so 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 that's one way of just you know figuring out who you shouldn't be with, um, and then just try to go with with a, a local option and and just Google around. I. Hopefully you can find, sorry, this is not the best advice because it's not, there isn't like a, a central database in which you can find, um, you, you know, your ideal bank. Although I will also say this, there are a bunch of bank switch websites that do tend to be able to tell you in many markets what the best banks are for you. Um, so just, you know, type in bank switch um, and you'll probably find something. There are at least three uh, websites I know of that, that can get you an answer. On the pension fund side, you're probably going to have to write them that email that we've talked about a couple of times to ask them uh, whether or not, like it, if, if, for example, your pension fund has said that they've divested, ask them whether they've um, done so across all asset classes and specifically mention uh, bonds or fixed income um, and private equity. Um, so you can actually kind of verify that yourself. Um, and, and, and you can also ask them, how often have you voted against the re-election of directors on the basis of environmental issues? Um, and that answer, I mean, that that will really tell you what they're doing because, I mean, uh, I was kind of laughing while um, reading through BlackRock's most recent report on this because they proudly announced um, something that they then uh, kind of themselves undercut, um, you know, in, in, this, in the very same report. They were talking about how many directors they had voted against. And, um, they were. They proudly announced they had voted. They had voted against. Um, it actually varied in the report. So they said 53 and 55. I don't know which it is, but 50 some um, directors on the basis of climate. And then later on, they they mentioned that they had voted against 5,500 directors on the basis of governance issues. So how seriously do you think BlackRock is taking this issue? If one percent of uh, you know, if they're they're applying this principle one percent of the time for climate that they're applying um, on on governance issues, yeah. So anyway, you can get really revealing answers to those questions because those are the really high impact things. Um, so ask those questions and let me know what you hear back. I'm deadly curious. Um, I think I suspect there's a lot of people will be getting in touch with you for advice or or, or thoughts after this if you're, if you're happy to be. <laughs> You can't do it. But there's also been questions because you've talked a lot about how the focus needs to be on uh, debt and on the role of banks. So mm -hmm. the question that's come in from Peter Woodsford and, and similar things from others is we've got this financial services. They're a major generator of inequality. They largely serve the haves. Um, and if I can also throw in, and they're also the people issuing the money for fossil fuels. So mm -hmm. what should our investment, mm -hmm. uh, what should be our attitude be to investment in, fin in the financial sector as well? Should we treat it like we would treat the fossil fuel sector? So, uh, I love that question too. Um, I mean, I certainly think that if you, 
one could imagine that the divestment movement will train its sights on banks next, because it's actually not a large group of targets. You could end up excluding like 40, 60, 80 big banks that are account for a very large proportion of this uh, lending and underwriting. Um, and, you, and you could imagine that they would become, in fact, they're already becoming um, a major target of the divestment movement. Um, as you can see with um, Divest Barclays, for example, that's a big thing because Barclays is the largest uh, financier of fossil fuels in Europe. Um, so that's something for us to take very seriously here in the UK. Um, but, so, but even if that doesn't happen, I think even as a shareholder, you should be particularly aggressive with the banks because they're just the nexus of so much of this activity. Um, and again, actually, um, insurance companies I would put into a similar category, although I think they're actually a little bit more interested in doing something because they actually recognize risk. That's kind of their jobs um, to look at risk. Um, and they're doing, you know, they're insuring um, these, these companies that are, you know, might be building a new facility that that needs insurance and um, the directors need insurance. Um, and critically, insurance companies are disproportionate owners of bonds. So they, they own a, just a, a vastly larger sum of the total bond market than you would expect given their size. So, um, so I love the idea that we would um, you know, put squarely in our sights uh, these um, players within the financial system, um, whether it be through um, divestment or through voting against the re-election of di their directors on the basis of their activities in this space. I think probably the, the latter um, for, for, this, for these players might be best um, just because, I, yeah, we, we don't have much time, essentially. I think probably best to try voting against directors first. So there's another, I mean, we have the best part of 100 questions. We were due to end now, but if it's right, I might overrun oh. by a few minutes just because um, there's so much left. But if you're exhausted, then do, do say. Um, so there's one question about um, from John Corbyn. So oil and gas companies typically use about 5% of the total oil and gas that they produce themselves. All of the rest of it... Hmm they sell on to others. There are consumers who are responsible for most of the carbon footprint of fossil fuels when you're in a car, when you heat your home. So is it right to be focusing on the companies and their access to money? Or is it actually about more taxation on fuels in general and tackling the consumer behaviour or other company behaviour, the people who actually use the fossil fuels? Another really good question. So, I mean, a, let me start by saying, I think we do need carbon pricing, which is effectively a tax that would fall on the consumer in the end, um, which I would hope, by the way, would end up being a carbon dividend that would disproportionately pay back to people in the lower end of the income scale for a number of reasons. That seems to be the right way to go, um, especially in terms of acceptability. Um, but I think there's a, a broader issue there, because if you look at just increasing the cost of petrol, for example, um, is that really going to get everyone to switch to electric vehicles? Um, the answer is no, not if there aren't enough charging stations, not if electric vehicles are uh, not sold in um, uh, dealerships, which they're often not because dealerships can't make as much money off of um, uh, the um, repairs for electric vehicles because they don't have a drivetrain and all this kind of um, internal machinery that usually requires more repairs. That's how dealerships make their money. So it's it's not it's not there. You, you can't test drive it as easily. Um, you don't know if you're, you might have range anxiety. You know, we think of ways that we, um, you know, worry about running out of petrol, but there, you know, you can imagine what you would do in that scenario, um, perhaps more easily. Anyway, there are all these kind of cultural infrastructural barriers in place that need to be addressed before you could ever kind of get at that issue on the consumer side by simply increasing the price of certain things. Um, so I think that we need to address, we, we need to focus on the fossil fuel companies because that's where we're getting the new infrastructure that kind of bakes in this stuff. And by the way, I include um, internal combustion engines as a form of uh, fossil fuel lock-in because that's what the literature tells us too that's one of the top um, sources of fossil fuel lock-in is internal combustion engines but you know putting that responsibility on each individual consumer i don't think is the right way to go in fact fossil fuel companies specifically financed efforts to get um all of these campaigns to focus on individual efforts precisely because they know that it's not very effective at producing widespread change um so you really do need to look at you know the 
the the big moving pieces and and shift those first. Um, and you know, sure, we need carbon pricing, and that would affect um, you know the, the the end consumers' behaviors at at the margin as well. And hopefully, we'd get carbon pricing to a level high enough that it would change um, some decision making. Um, but that won't be enough if we don't get some of those big pieces in place, and if we don't get legislation um, that fossil fuel companies don't want in the first place. I remember when I found out that the whole idea of, of uh, your personal carbon footprint was so pushed by the fossil fuel companies, it, it was really quite shocking. And I think it's, you know, one of the things that I took away, it was probably you who told me, um, but it's really quite a, a powerful thought that that focus on personal behavior let some people off. I'd like to finish with two questions, if I can, and that will still, I'm afraid, leave us with the best part of 50 that we haven't managed to touch. Um, uh, which is, is, is shows just how much interest there's been. This has been the most, the best attended uh, Cambridge Festival event we've ever held. Um, uh, so I want one question from, from Georgia Davies, which really starts to make us think a bit more about oh, the overseas situation. So you're talking about the challenge of shutting down fossil fuel infrastructure that's already been built because the upfront cost has already been put. So. To what extent do you think low income countries, newly emerging economies will become more sustainable, use more renewable energy in the future than countries that have already developed because they haven't committed all of that resource already? I, I definitely think, well, I, let's say, okay, first of all, I hope um, that there will be this kind of leapfrogging, but I also think there almost certainly will be. Um, I mean, we definitely need to encourage that um, in a number of ways, um, financially and otherwise. Um, but I think I, I would be very surprised to see the same kind of trajectory, uh, infrastructure trajectory in country, in low income countries as uh, the ones that we've seen in uh, very wealthy countries such as this one. And then the final question, uh, going back to universal ownership. So um, you've got this idea that universal owners are those major pension funds, other institutions investors who just have that cross section of, of the entirety of society. They own a slice of everything. So the question from Keshav, which takes us to a sort of fairly interesting fundamental question. Are you essentially saying that universal owners should act as a legislature trying to improve social welfare? And is that, I'm gonna add this bit, is that really what we think should be the role of pension funds as opposed to genuine elected legislatures? Such a good question. And it's actually something I struggle with, to be honest. Um, but here, here are a couple of ways you can think about it. One is that currently, like the status quo is that pension funds are unwittingly contributing to making these systemic risks worse. So that's the default. That's where we're working from now. Um, and by the way, that does involve some undemocratic behaviors because again, probably unwittingly, um, the companies that pension funds invest in are lobbying, including through trade associations and directly against some of the legislation that we want legislatures to pass. So that's that's the status quo. I, I would view pension funds taking these issues seriously and advocating for improving them. I, I would say that's that would be an improvement on the status quo. But I think your concern, Keshav, remains actually. Um, who monitors the monitors is, a very big question. And it's one that, that does come up with universal ownership. Um, I think we have a couple of issues. One is that, I mean, capital crosses borders. And, um, and that means that forum shopping is always a risk. And, and, and companies will have every incentive to, um, to you know, move their operations to the, com the country that um, allows them the, the, the most lax um, regulatory regime. Um, and if that's the case, then you kind of need a cop that can also cross borders. And having now interviewed dozens upon dozens of these pension funds, um, it's kind of interesting because these are mainly people who could make money, more money working elsewhere, and they really do have their beneficiaries in mind. They, they kind of want to have uh, the population live long and dignified lives with a social safety net. That's a very different mindset. Um, and if they're sort of responsible for the whole system, you could imagine that that would induce in them a bit more of, of a sense of responsibility that might match the kind of global nature of some of these problems that we face. I mean, you 
very much could and, and perhaps should argue that that's what we have international treaties for. That's why we have governments negotiating um, around these issues. Um, and I guess I just see universal owners as being more or less supportive of those efforts. Because actually, if you can imagine that right now, by de facto, universal owners and um, investments are actually decreasing the probability that those governments will come together and create a treaty that will start to close some of these gaps, but they could be doing things that would actually be supportive of those efforts legislatively at the country level and at the international level. And I suppose on balance, I would very much hope that they would be supportive of those legislative efforts um, to reduce all of these, these risks. Um, but that isn't to say that that concern is bunk. I, I think quite the opposite. It's something that needs to be thought through really carefully. Um, I just think that uh, we don't have much time. And in, in these international treaties need to, to become incredibly ambitious and, and aggressive and, um, it, and it ha needs to happen now. And if we have the support of these, the largest blocks of capital in the world, um, that will make it much more likely that we'll actually get what democratically people seem to want. If you look at these polls all over the world, people want less inequality, people want um, more uh, uh, climate change mitigation efforts um, and so on and so forth. Um, so in this strange way, it ends up reflecting more accurately the actual democratic wishes of the public um, to have the involvement of these large funds. But but I still think it's, it's an open question how you manage that going forward from a governance perspective. Alan, this has been a, a fantastic evening. And just to finish by quoting uh, a comment from Audley Burnett, what a talk, agile, urgent, informed, a triumph to answer questions on the hoof like that. I couldn't put it better myself. So thank you so much for, for giving us so much information, responding to so many questions. I'm sure there's a lot more. Just if people do want to know more, where should they look for more about universal ownership and, and, and your work? Where's the best place to get a primer on it? Um, so I, I have written a number of papers um, and the divestment report itself has two appendices you should look at. No one ever looks at the appendices, but appendices four and five are actually some of the building blocks of what I've said today. So that's the university's um, uh, divestment report on the website. I think, I, I think Julian's looking it up right now. Um, and I do have a paper that I'm just going to also pop into. Is it, Julian, should I put it in the chat or can people yeah. see that? If you put it in the chat, people should be able to see it. Great. Um, okay, so and this is my um, my paper that's kind of a, a a practical framework for universal owners. So it's meant to be plain language and um, accessible to people outside the field. Um, if you find anything in it that is not clear to you, please let me know because I do actually want it to be um, broadly accessible. Sorry. But there, I have a bunch of other papers, and you can find them on uh, the Caesar website. Probably still lists them. So yeah. Caesar is the Cambridge Centre for Existential Risk. So Ellen, thank you very, very much um, for joining us. Thank you for everybody who's joined us for, for today's event, uh, which is part of the Cambridge Festival. Um, we hope to see you at other events that we're running um, here at Jesus College. So uh, we have a couple of things coming up this week, looking at atoms and looking at ripples, uh, looking at both the science and the artistic elements of, of ripples. And then we have an amazing program coming up next term and afterwards. So join our mailing list, join Twitter, join Facebook, follow us. And I hope you've had a wonderful evening. So wonderful to see you. Thanks for being with us.